Knife of Dreams begins with Galat Damodred. Galat is on his way to see the Lord Captain Commander of the Children of the Light, Amon Balda. Because he has been told that Balda abused and killed his stepmother, Morghese Trakand. So now Galad has decided to confront and kill Amon Balda. When Galad finds him, he challenges him to a trial beneath the light for abusing and killing Morghese. A trial beneath the light is basically a one-on-one -on -one sword fight to the death. Amon Balda denies the accusations but accepts the challenge and after a very close fight, Galad kills Amon Balda. Because Galad kills Balda in a trial beneath the light, Galad takes up Amon Balda's rank, so he is now the new Lord Captain Commander of the Children of the Light. Galad tells his new forces that they will fight against the Shadow in the last battle, and that whether they like it or not, they will do it next to the Aes Sedai. In the country of Terebon, Rodo Ituralda and his army launch a bunch of guerrilla-type raids against the Sonchan. Ituralda's plan is to enrage the Sonchan and make them chase him across the country and lead them into his trap. We then see High Lady Suroth. Suroth is very worried because Tuon has not been found yet and she thinks that she might be dead. She goes to meet with one of her generals and she is told that a man by the name of Rodo Ituralda and his army are attacking all over Terabon. Suroth is furious by this news and she orders the head of Rodo Ituralda. When Suroth returns to her room, she finds Semerag, one of the Forsaken, waiting for her. Suroth turns out to be a dark friend and Semerag has come to inform her that she has killed all of the Imperial family of Sonchen except for Tuan and now the entire continent of Sonchan is in complete chaos. Semerak wants Suroth to become the new empress of Sonchan, but they need to make sure that Tuon is dead. After being captured by the White Tower Aes Sedai, Iwen Alvir is dosed off with Forkroot and taken to the White Tower. She learns that Leon was also captured, but the White Tower Aes Sedai don't believe she is the real Leon because she doesn't look like she used to. When Iwen arrives at the White Tower, she is taken to the mistress of novices, Silviana Brehon. Silviana tells Iwen that she's no Aes Sedai and that she has to start over as a novice, but Iwen disagrees and tells her that since she was chosen to be the Amorlin seat, she is Aes Sedai. Iwen is to be given Forkroot constantly so that she is only able to channel a little bit. She then tells Silviana that she is a dreamer and that she dreamt that the Sonchan will attack the White Tower at some point. At night, Iwain goes to Telaranriad to meet with Swan Sanche and she informs her of what happened to her and Leon. Iwain orders Swan to tell the rebel Aes Sedai not to try any rescue attempts. The next day, Swan tells the rebel camp what Iwain told her and they reluctantly agree not to rescue her. Back in the White Tower, Elida receives a visit from Beonin Merinie, an Aes Sedai of the Grey Aja. Beonin is loyal to Elida and she has been spying on the rebel Aes Sedai for some time. She informs Elida that Iwain has been meeting with Swan Sanche in Telaranriad and then she reveals the names of some rebel Aes Sedai spies that have been working in the White Tower. She also teaches Elida how to make gateways and other weaves that the White Tower Aes Sedai didn't know how to make. Elida wants to subdue Iwain and make her renounce the title of Amorlin Seat, but Iwain refuses to do so. Iwain, on the other hand, is trying to undermine Elida by protesting peacefully. Whenever she is beaten, she refuses to show any pain, and in the novice classes, she constantly outperforms her own teachers. After a while, the other novices begin to look up to Iwain, and she even earns the respect of some Aes Sedai. Elida and the other Aes Sedai get very frustrated with Iwain because she shows no signs of giving in, and they don't know what to do. The Forsaken have a meeting in Telaranriad and we learn that their new leader, Morden, used to be Ishamael. Morden tells the Forsaken that Samael might still be alive 
because someone that looks like him has sent thousands of Trollocs into the ways. They all agree to look for the remaining seals to the Dark One's prison and Moradin orders them not to kill Randall Thor because he wants to be the one to kill him. But he shows them images of the other two Tyverian, Matt Cawthon and Perrin Ivara and tells them that they are free to kill both of them. Perrin Ivara is so desperate to free Fael that he agrees to work with the Sonchan to defeat the Shido Aeo. He goes to meet with some Sonchan generals and they begin to negotiate their alliance. Perrin tells them that he doesn't have a lot of soldiers but he does have a lot of channelers. He asks the Sonchan to not leash any of them and the Sonchan agree. Perrin then reveals his plan to defeat the Shido. He says that he needs a large amount of fork root because he plans on poisoning the water that the Shido are drinking with it. By doing so, the Shido Wise Ones will be unable to channel and therefore it will be much easier to defeat them. The Sun Chen like Perrin's plan but they say that they need special permission to get their hands on the fork root. Perrin pulls out a piece of paper from High Lady Suroth that gives him special permission. The Sun Chan are very impressed with him and they agree to work together. Perrin and his Sun Chan allies use the special permission papers to acquire all the fork root they need from a Sun Chan outpost. They then travel back to where the Shido are and they poison the Shido's drinking water with the fork root. They then wait for the fork root to take effect. Fael, Aleandre and Megden are still having a terrible time as Gaishan to the Shido Aeo. Fael is trying to steal the Ulthroth for Galena because Galena has promised to help her escape if she gets it for her, but so far she hasn't been able to steal it. An Aeo man by the name of Rolan has taken a special interest in Fael and he has been keeping her somewhat safe. A Gaishan kid by the name of Thero manages to steal the Othroth for Fael and he gives it to her. Fael is very thankful and she promises to help him escape. Galena hears that the Othroth is missing and she goes to confront Fael because she thinks that she has finally managed to steal it. Fael tells her that she does have it but that it's hidden away and she would only give it to Galena if she promises to help her and her group of friends escape. Galena agrees to do so but she tells her to meet her at some abandoned house. When they meet at the abandoned house, Fael and her friends give Galena the Othroth. Galena then steps outside of the house and she makes the entrance collapse. Fael, Aleandre and Megden are now trapped in the house. Fael remembers hearing that Megden can channel a little bit, so she tells her to try her hardest and make a red flag outside of the house move. Megden tries her hardest and after some time, she finally does it. Some of the Gaishan see the flag moving and then they spot Fael trapped. The Gaishan and also Roland help Fael and her friends escape the rubble and then they notice that a battle has erupted in the Shido camp. Fael immediately thinks that Perrin has finally come to rescue her. Perrin Ivara and his allies finally launch their attack on the Shido. Before the battle, an Ashaman brought Rand's father, Tamal Thor, and a bunch of Two Rivers men to assist in the battle. They notice that the fork root plan worked and there's only a few Shido wise ones channeling. As the battle rages on, Aram the Tinker Boy suddenly turns on Perrin and he tries to kill him. He tells Perrin that Masima told him the truth about him and Elias. He says that their yellow eyes means that they are Shadowspawn and that he brought the Trollocs to the two rivers. So now he has to save Fael from Perrin. Perrin has no other choice but to kill him, but before he does, Aram is killed by a Shadow Arrow. Perrin then notices Fael and a bunch of Gaishan being led by a big Shido man. Perrin goes after Fael and he kills the big Shido man who turns out to be Roland. After the battle is won, the Sun Chan take hundreds of Shido Wise Ones as the money and they also manage to capture Sivana. Masima's forces were almost completely decimated but he still survived with only some of his men. 
Galina is escaping through the woods when suddenly she comes across Terava and the surviving Shido. They take the Ulthroth from her and they make her Gaishan again. Therava and the Shido decide to go back to the Threefold Land and Galina is to be Therava's plaything for the rest of her life. Matt Cawthon and his company are still trying to escape the Sanchan by traveling with Balan Luca's menagerie. When Matt overhears Oliver and Noel Charon tell stories about the famous legendary traveler from Malkir, Jane Farstrider, Matt asks Noel if he knows Farstrider. Noel says that he is his cousin and tells them that Farstrider is a fool who abandoned his wife. Matt notices that the Illuminator Aludra has been experimenting with her fireworks. She tells Matt that she needs more materials to make her experiment into a more lethal weapon. Aludra is pretty much inventing cannons and she wants to use them against the Sunchan because they destroyed the Illuminator's guild. She calls her new invention dragons and Matt decides to help her out by taking her to his friend Randall Thor who can help them make more of these weapons. Matt and Tuon are still getting to know each other and she tells him that there's a prophecy that says that the dragon reborn must kneel before the crystal throne before the last battle. Matt is very confused by this prophecy. Tan Marilyn has been reading a letter over and over again for some time and one day Matt finally asks what the letter is. Tom gives Matt the letter to read and Matt is shocked when he realizes that it is from Moraine Damadred. Moraine tells Tom in the letter that she knew everything that was going to happen to her the day she apparently died. She says that she is not dead and that one day him, Matt, and one other man that she does not know may go to rescue her and that Matt knows the way to find her. She also says that he may only show the letter to Matt when he asks about it. After reading the letter, Matt realizes that Moraine must be trapped with the Elfin and Ilfin because the doorway that Moraine and Lanfear went through leads to them. But since the doorway melted when they went through it, he doesn't know how to get there. Over and all Charon overhear the conversation and Over tells them that according to Brigitta, the Tower of Genjai will take them to the land of the Elfin and Ilfin. Suddenly Matt remembers seeing a tower that fits the Tower of Genjai's description. In Book 1, when Matt, Rand and Tom were escaping Shadar Logoth in Bel Domon's ship, Matt and Domon saw a big shiny tower. Matt confirms that he and Beldomon know where the Tower of Genjai is and Olver tells them that according to Brigitta, they can only enter the tower by making a specific sign with the bronze knife in the side of the tower. Matt agrees to go rescue Moraine with Tom and Noah Charon volunteers to go with them. Later, Tuon tells Matt that she wants to go to a tavern because she's never been to one so Matt and Tom take her to one. At the tavern, Tom learns that there's a Sunchan army looking for a woman that is impersonating the daughter of the Nine Moons and that they mean to kill her. The impersonator is described to look exactly like Tuan, which confuses Matt and Tom because they expected the Sunchan to be looking for Tuan, but not that they would want to kill her. When they tell Tuan the news, she is not surprised. Matt wants to safely take Tuon back to Evudar so she can deal with this dilemma but he also has to take his group of Aes Sedai away from the Sunchan. Matt and his group decide to make their own way so they leave Bell and Luca's menagerie. As they travel through some woods, they come upon Talmanis and a small portion of the Band of the Red Hand. So Matt and his band are finally reunited. Tuon asks Tom if it isn't weird that Matt's band managed to find him randomly in the woods and Tom tells her that since Matt is Tiberian, he often finds what he needs even before he needs it but Tuon dismisses this as superstition. She is very impressed by the discipline of the band of the Red Hand and by how much respect they have for Matt. Tuon's Death Watch guard has been looking for her ever since she disappeared and now they finally caught up to her. 
The Death Watch Guard are the personal guards of the Empress and it's composed of Ogier and men. When Tuon sees them, she tells Matt that she completely trusts them, so Matt allows them to take Tuon back to Evudar. They know that there's a conspiracy within the Sunchan army to kill Tuon, so when they hear that a Sunchan force has been sent to kill her, they decide to work with Matt to defeat them. Then, out of nowhere, Tuon says that Matt is her husband three times, and with this, she completes their marriage ceremony. Matrim Cawthon is now the Prince of the Ravens. Matt, the Vand, and the Death Watch Guard set up an ambush for the Sun Chan, and Aludra sets up her new weapons on top of a hill. When the traitorous Sun Chan army arrives, they are completely decimated. The Death Watch Guard figure out that the leader of the traitorous Sun Chan army was a man that worked for High Lady Suroth. When Tuon and the Death Watch Guard return to Ebudar, they confront Suroth, and Tuon strips her of all her titles and she is given to the Death Watch Guard to do as they wish. In Andor, the Siege of Camelon continues. Elaine Trakant and Brigitta Silverbow have hired many mercenaries, but they're still heavily outnumbered by the opposition. But still, with the help of Avienda, the Seafolk and the Kin, they have managed to put up a strong defense. One of the kinswomen returns to Camelin after managing to recruit Lieutenant Charles Guyben and around 10,000 troops of his. Elaine is so happy by this that she promotes Lieutenant Guyben to captain. When Elaine and Avienda return to the royal palace, Avienda gives Elaine a dagger that she says gives the wielder the ability to become invisible to shadow spawn and maybe even the dark one. Avienda realizes that she is able to read Terangriel, so her and Elaine go to their Terangriel stash and they learn what all of them do. They're suddenly interrupted by some Aeo wise ones that have come to take Avienda away. They say that it is time for the Aeo to leave Andor and Avienda must come with them because she has to resume her training to become a wise one. Elaine gives Avienda a Terangriel that lets her go into Telaranriad, and then they say their goodbyes. The next day, one of Elaine's allies brings in a very successful thief by the name of Samuel Hark, and they decide to use him to follow Doylin Melor, who is Elaine's captain of the guards. Elaine doesn't trust Melor anymore, and she thinks that he is a spy. Hark the Thief agrees to follow Melar, and after some days, he returns to Elaine and he tells her that Melar has repeatedly visited a house that is occupied by Aes Sedai. After Hark describes the Aes Sedai, Elaine realizes that they are the Black Aja sisters that escaped the White Tower with Leandrin in Book 2. Elaine orders the arrest of Melar, and then she and Brigitta form a team to go confront the Black Aja sisters. Elaine thinks that there's only a few Black Aja sisters in the house, so she only takes a few Aes Sedai with her and leaves Brigitta and the rest of the team outside. Unfortunately, there's more than a few Black Aja sisters in the house, so when Elaine and the Aes Sedai arrive, they are overwhelmed and the Aes Sedai are killed. Elaine is left alive, but she's taken prisoner. Through the water bond, Brigitta and the Aes Sedai waters feel that something is wrong. Suddenly, the waters go into rage mode and they storm the Black Aja house. Brigitta knows that that means that the Aes Sedai are dead, but Brigitta can feel that Elaine is being kept alive, so she returns to the palace and gets some help. At the palace, she learns that Elaine's opposition has decided to strike the city at that exact moment. So Brigitta orders the channelers to make gateways and she divides Elaine's army. Some of them go defend the city and the rest go rescue Elaine. Brigitta leads the rescue party and they manage to track Elaine down to a wagon. They battle the Black Aja and many of Elaine's soldiers die but they do manage to rescue her. The Black Aja sisters are captured and Elaine is updated on the attack on the city. Elaine and her rescue party 
decide to use gateways to flank the opposition and after a long battle Elaine manages to win and she takes the opposition's leaders hostage. Before the battle Elaine needed the support of 10 houses to become the Queen of Andor but after this great victory she managed to secure the support of 9. Throughout the coming days conversation shifts to the Borderlander army that is still inside Andor. The High Houses think that the Borderlanders are getting ready to attack but Elaine tells them the truth. She tells them that she already made a deal with them and that they mean no harm because they're only looking for the Dragon Reborn. With this, Elaine gains the support of two more houses and so Elaine Trakhand finally becomes the Queen of Andor. Randall Thor and his party are still resting in Tyr after the cleansing of Sidene. Rand has been having visions of the strange men that saved his life during the battle against Samael in Sharalogoth in Book 7. He thinks that he is now linked to these men because they crossed Belfire streams during the battle. When Loghain arrives from the Black Tower, he informs Rand of the state of the Black Tower. He says that Mazrim Taim has been building a tower of his own within the Black Tower and that every man inside this tower is loyal to Taim and not to Rand. Loghain thinks that Taim is a dark friend but Rand does not believe so. Rand's current plan is to make a truce with the Sun Chan because he wants to fully focus on the last battle and not in the Sun Chan but not many people agree with this decision. Later, Loyal's mother Elder Hammond and Loyal's soon-to-be wife Aerith finally manage to track him down and when they arrive to see him Loyal gets very worried because he thinks that they will take him back to the steading and he won't be able to finish writing his book about Rand. Loyal goes to see them and he is quickly married to Aerith in an Ogier ceremony. He's then told that they have to return to their steading because they're going to open the Book of Translation and return to their world. The Book of Translation is an artifact that has the power to transport the Ogier to their original world. The Ogier are not originally from this world and they only came to it during or before the Age of Legends. Loyo is against using the Book of Translation and he tells them that they need to stay in this world and help the humans fight the shadow like they did during the War of Power and the Trolloc Wars. Loyo suddenly notices a large force of Trollocs and he goes to tell Rand. Rand and his forces go out to face the Trollocs and during the battle Rand loses control to Louis Theron. Louis Theron makes very powerful weaves that no one knew about and the Ashaman quickly learn these new weaves and they manage to eradicate the Trollocs. After the battle, Louis Theron is suicidal and he refuses to release Sidene. Rand and Louis Theron agree to die at the last battle and with that Louis Theron finally releases Sidene. Loyal tells Rand that he has to return to his steading to speak to the other Ogier and Rand asks him to close the gateways that are still open so that the Trollocs stop using them to come south. Elder Hammond wants Loyal to go speak to the other Ogier so he volunteers to close the gateways. Afterwards, Devran Bashir informs Rand that the daughter of the Nine Moons has agreed to meet with him and negotiate peace. After the battle, Nynaeve and Lan speak about Rand and the Borderlands. Lan is not happy with Rand because even though everyone knows that the last battle will take place in the Borderlands, Rand has pretty much forgotten about this so Lan wants to go to Shinar to help the Borderlanders prepare for the last battle. Nynaeve agrees with him so she offers to take him to the Borderlands but she wants Lan to promise her that he'll accept any man that asks to join him in his quest. Lan agrees so Nynaeve makes a gateway to the very edge of Saldea in the Borderlands. Nynaeve does this because she wants Lan to travel all across the Borderlands gathering men in his journey to Shinar. 
She then travels all across the borderlands, telling the survivors and the relatives of dead Malkir that their uncrowned king, Landman Dragoran, is riding to Tarmangaiden. She asks them if their king will ride alone, and one by one, the Malkiri answer no, and so they raise the Golden Crane. Randall Thor and his most powerful channelers go to speak with the daughter of the Nine Moons. When they arrive at the house they are supposed to meet at, they meet with a small woman that is supposed to be the daughter of the Nine Moons. But for a small moment, the woman's disguise flickers and Rand realizes that she is the forsaken Semirog. Rand and Louis Theron fight for control of Sidene and Semirog channels a fireball at him. A defenseless Rand stops it with his left hand and then falls to the ground. Rand's allies manage to stop the Forsaken and when Rand recovers, he realizes that his left hand is gone. They take Samarok hostage and the Forsaken tells everyone that Rand hears the voice of Louis Theron in his head and that people who hear voices always end up going completely insane. Rand decides to let the captured Suldam and the money go because he wants them to inform the real daughter of the Nine Moons that he still wants to meet with her. In a wooden box, they find male and female Adams and Nynaeve realizes that Igyanin and Beldaman failed to get rid of the male Adam like they were supposed to at the end of Book 4 and now the Sonchan have made copies of it. Finally, we see Pevara, Tarna and four other Red Aja sisters as they arrive at the Black Tower in Andor. The Red Aja have officially decided to bond Ashaman so they go to speak with Mazrem Taim. They find Taim waiting for them on a throne and when the Red Sisters announce their proposition, Taim immediately accepts. The Red Sisters are very surprised by this and Taim tells them to simply accept his answer and to remember the old saying let the Lord of Chaos rule.